This week, we are pleased to present Refocusing the Gender Lens, a conversation with Ricky Wilchins in partnership with the Women's Fund of Central Ohio and the Columbus Foundation, and with support from Outlook Media. Won't you please help me thank our partners and sponsors. Our speaker today will leave you thinking, challenging what you learned about people growing up, and how you treat people in your day-to-day -day life, in the workplace, at school, in homes, and in your neighborhoods. Please welcome author, thought leader, and dynamic speaker, the executive director of True, True Child, Ricky Wilchins. Ricky is going to talk with us for a while to set the stage, and then she will join Brad Mitchell at the table for questions. Would you also join me in welcoming both of our speakers? And Ricky, the podium is yours. Thank you. And thank you, Jane, for having me, and especially Nicole and Carol for bringing me in. Um, I, I grew up in, well, I haven't grown up yet, but I was born and raised in, in Cincinnati. And um, so it's especially nice to be back here in Columbus, the, the Paris of the Midwest. Um, since I'm used to flying into Cincinnati, it was really cool flying here because you guys have stumbled on the unique idea of having your airport in the state, <laughs> which I really want to take back to Cincinnati and see if they might want to try that. I, I missed the 75-minute commute into the city. Um, I'm also supposed to say at some point, how about that football team? So let me get that out of the way. <laughs> um, I wanted to try to talk about, you know, gender and gender norms, and it's always kind of a fraught discussion. By the way, I, I decided not to podium today because I don't podium well. I need to be like moving and talking. It's kind of a Jewish thing. My hands will start moving. So if anybody gets dizzy watching me, just stare at the ceiling. But. Um, you know, gender is one of those overloaded terms in the English language. We use it to mean so many things. And so, God, you guys got quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> a hush. Awesome. Um, when I talk to foundations, I say, you know, a lot of funders say, oh, you know, we use a gender lens. Or I'll talk to people at uh, the CDC, and they say, oh, we use a gender lens in this. And I'll say, well, you say you use a gender lens. What you really mean is that you prioritize women and girls. You prioritize equity for women and girls, which is incredibly important. The funding and policies that we have for women and girls are not, not where they should be. But what kind of gets lost is the other part of the gender, which is gen the gender discussion, which is gender norms. So when we get into the gender norms thing, then we have yet another dichotomy. Remember I say I was overloaded. And people say, oh, no, I, I get the gender thing. I get the gender thing. You want to talk about gender norms and masculinity? I get that kids who don't fit traditional gender norms, who are gay or transgender, or just don't happen to be the most you know, masculine little boy in the world, or feminine little girl. I get that those kids often grow up in a world of, hate, of pain and discrimination. I get that. And I go, well, that's, that, and that's, that's an important discussion to have, too. And that's kind of the LGBT thing, or as we now say, the LGBTQ, or in some cases, the LGBTI. Basically, as soon as straight people master the acronym, we add another letter. <laughs> so you're never going to feel politically correct at this. Do I lie? <laughs> it mutates, you know. But, you know, that's the LGBTQ discussion. I want to talk about the kids who are gender conforming, the ones who do fit, the ones who are often, you know, our sons and daughters also, and who we don't talk about as much when it comes to gender. And so I never know quite where to dive into this. So um, let me tell a story, because to me it's all about stories and people. So, and I want to apologize to people who are just at the Women's Fund. Thank you again, because you've heard all these, and I'm going to repeat some of the same stories. But I love this one. So one of my heroes is a woman named Hortensia Amaro, who is just a genius at this stuff and has been writing papers for years and is one of the country's recognized experts. So in 1991, as HIV is just starting to detonate, in the US, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, invites 40 of the top researchers around gender and reproductive health to come to a retreat in Texas. I'm not sure why people want to go to a retreat in Texas, but anyway. And says, you know, tell us what we ought to do next. What's, what's the next big drop on the meter 
in program, effective, po program and policy effectiveness that we can get? What should we be doing? So they had this two-day retreat, and out of it comes this luminous paper called Love, Sex, Power. And it's written by Hortensia. It's actually, first it's a speech, which is the one that's been po po uh, posted the most, and, we, and then she wrote a paper, which has now been cited like a thousand times, maybe more than any reproductive health policy paper ever that I can certainly find on Google Scholar. And in it, it says, one of the key drivers, maybe the key drivers, of young people's behavior when they get in intimate situations is gender norms, what they think boys and girls should do. Duh-uh, we kind of all knew that, right? And yet, we are studying sexual behavior in a gender vacuum. We are ignoring the impact of social gender norms. So that paper gets cited everywhere, it shoots all over, people are using it in academia in academia. It never impacts policy. It never impacts funding priorities. It never impacts programs. And so I guess what I want to start is there are now maybe 30 years worth of really solid basic research that shows really clearly when boys and girls particularly buy into rigid ideals for masculinity and femininity, they have markedly lower life outcomes on a cluster of related measures. Markedly lower life outcomes on a cluster of related measures. For instance, young boys who buy into traditional masculinity as defined by you know, strength, aggression, sexual prowess, emotional toughness, and dominance, tend to have earlier sex. They have more partners, including professional sex workers, commercial sex workers. They tend to have lower condom use. They have more risky behavior, not just in sex, but also with cars and with substances. They are more likely to engage in LGBT bullying as well as girlfriend abuse. They're more likely to get in trouble in school. They're more likely to get kicked out of school. And you can kind of flip that on its head and do the same thing with girls. Girls who buy into what I think of as the three Ds. You have to be deferential, desirable, and dependent. They also tend to get have more teen pregnancies, teen and unplanned pregnancies. They have lower condom use. They have less condom negotiation skills. They're more likely to accept an abusive boyfriend. They're more likely to drop out of school early. I mean, it's like this whole kind of cluster that goes together, especially around economic empowerment, education, and reproductive and basic health. In fact, speaking of uh, basic health, we're doing a project now for the Heinz Endowments in Pittsburgh, um, studying the impact of gender norms on young black women and girls. In, in, in and around their community. And what we found was that race and gender norms together have specific impacts on young black girls that can affect their health and wellness throughout their life. For instance, the idea that they need to be primary caretakers. Many of these girls are taking care of younger siblings and older infirm elders in their home practically from the time they're adolescents. This kind of pressure combined with dealing with the impacts of race and in some communities low income and poverty plus the gender norm expectation can lead some of these girls to what's called a weathering effect where their immune systems start to break down under stress. But no one's really talking to them about the gender piece of that. So we're starting to kind of address that with model curricula in the Pittsburgh community. But my point is there's this cluster of lower outcomes and yet I don't think anything that I've told you in the last six minutes, boy, it seems longer than that, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't think anything I've told you in the last, I haven't seen anybody's jaw drop and go, oh my god, I didn't know that. I've, I've just never thought of that. But we all kind of know this because we all got through junior high school. <laughs> Anybody here not get through junior high school? <laughs> Hands? OK. So if you made it through junior high school, you may have forgotten about that. I know I've tried to. But it was still there. And your kids are going through it, your nieces or nephews. It's like a pressure cooker. It's like a pressure cooker. Perhaps the primary rite of passage for almost every adolescent when they hit those middle school years, what they call the gender intensification period, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, the primary rite of passage is mastering traditional gender norms. You know, I was in a Starbucks recently, and I saw these girls, you know, and they're like kind of practicing doing feminine. They're crossing their legs, and the arms are going low, and they're kind of talking like Valley Girl like this, and he was just so cute, and I just really loved it, you know? But, and, I, 
and they're practicing, and it's, it's a little bit over the top, and you can tell, but they're, you know, in 10 years, they'll never remember any of that. They're practicing, they're learning, they're mastering gender norms. And what's happening is kids learn this, but they don't learn it from us. They learn it from their friends, they learn it from social media, they learn it from videos, they learn it from games, but we're not having that dialogue with them. And so what we're trying to do in, in a number of projects is to bring the gender norms part back into the discussion. So um, I, I guess I'm gonna go back to Heinz just for a moment, just as an example. What we did in that community was we started interviewing people in the community, talking to both the girls, and uh, girls and boys, but in this case mostly girls, and the people who serve them, and saying, what are the gender norms like in this community, and how can we start to challenge some of the harmful parts of them? We are now designing a curriculum of really simple exercises that we want to start them piloting in the community. And then we want to teach them to deliver it, and then have them teach the next people to deliver it. And we're kind of done with that piece. But the important takeaway is that when you talk to kids about gender norms, you get better results than if you don't. That shouldn't be very controversial. <laughs> when you talk to kids about gender norms, you get better results than if you don't. But we're, in general, that dialogue has not happened here. Now, if you look at the international sphere, they've pretty much drunk the Kool-Aid around this. It's an unfortunate metaphor, isn't it? <laughs> USAID will not fund new programs that lack a strong gender analysis that includes gender norms. PEPFAR, the President's AIDS Initiative in Africa, has made it the centerpiece of their work around violence against women and HIV. Um, UNAIDS, World Health Organization, uh, International Center for Research on Women, I could you know, go on. All these international organizations have found it just completely in, in, um, unavoidable in some cases in their work to start dealing with gender norms because otherwise they don't get the results that they want and need. But for some reason that hasn't really hit the US. And there's a whole discussion about why that might be and some theories. But for some reason, we haven't been able to do that in the US. Now, some people say, look, we just, you know, this gender norms thing is obviously important. We kind of get it. Um, you know, you have kids at home. I've heard this. I kind of see this. I've got a 13-year-old you know, son. But it's not really in the priorities of our funding or our policies or the programs we're doing. And I guess by way of counterexample, I'd like to use the World Bank, because the World Bank has been funding Basically, you know, from um, uh, what I guess we would have called it, what do you call it, gender blind lens. I guess you would say they're doing the gender equity piece, but they're not doing the gender norms piece, as I started out with. So they are trying to increase equity for women and girls, and in some case, young boys. But what they found was that after um, investing hundreds of millions of dollars over the years in grants and outright aid and so forth and loans, that there was like a ceiling on making further progress. They could put in more money, but they weren't getting a lot of social return on their charitable investment. And so they commissioned this voluminous report, which is the only report that the World Bank knows how to commission, and interviewed 4,000 people in over a year or so in, in 200 different communities in like, I don't know, 26 countries. I mean, it was a big thing. And what they found was holding them back, the ceiling, was, of course, uh, cultural gender norms. Um, there was differences across communities, but there were remarkable similarities. And what they found is if you're trying to increase uh, opportunity for women and girls, you can dump as much money and resources as you want, but if the rules in the local culture say girls don't do X, girls aren't going to do X. And it's just that simple. If the rules in the local culture say that boys don't do Y, boys aren't going to do Y. And I'll give you two quick examples, one domestic and one foreign. Um, we did a program around STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. We're doing a program around STEM um, for young girls of color for the Motorola Solutions Foundation in Chicago. And um, we finally just, you know, instead of dancing around it, because you have this whole kind of focus group guide, we finally just asked them straight up, you know, you know, can't girls be pretty and feminine and also smart at STEM? And they all just kind of crack, looked at each other and cracked up and said, not in middle school, they can't. <laughs> but, you know, the STEM programs that we have don't talk to girls about those pressures. The fact that girls are worried that boys won't see them as feminine. 
We give them role models. We give them opportunities. We give them better computer labs. We do a whole bunch of important things. But we're not talking to them about the feminine norms that is one of the key drivers of behavior. So the girls who were really good at STEM and really like STEM and got grades at it when they were seven or eight, suddenly when they're 11 or 12, start dropping out of STEM courses like flies. And we don't talk to them about feminine norms at all. Our partnering organization, a group called Promundo out of Brazil, which uh, they're strictly international facing and we're strictly domestic and they really pioneered this field. I often say that Promundo is what true child wants to be when we grow up. Promundo did a program, I, I believe it was in Turkey, and part of the culture, excuse me, the areas they're operating was I guess the Turkish men do not tend to stay around their wives when they give childbirth in the first few months um, because it's considered unmanly. That's, you know, that's, that's for the women to do. And so apparently the local numbers were like only one in five men was staying with his wife through the whole period. And so they went in and they tried to fo find men who were, had kind of really you know, non-homophobic, non non-sexist, non-violent masculinity and get them to talk to other men in you know, structured situations and exercises. And they found that they were able to jump that number from one in five to, between, to three or four out of five. So what happens? Well, you get higher infant birth weight, birth weight, lower infant mortality, lower mother mortality, you know, better maternal health. You know, it's a whole bunch, you know, less, less spousal abuse. There's a whole bunch of good things that happen just from this simple, simple thing of getting the guys to stay around through the entire process in the first early months of that child's life. And it was getting men to talk to men about masculinity. It's getting some men to talk to men about masculinity. So these, these exercises, this what they call a gender transformative approach, you know, it's kind of a mouthful. Gender transformative approaches are those policies, programs, funding priorities that try to highlight, challenge, and ultimately change these <coughs> harmful gender norms and inequities. These gender transformative approaches can be really, really powerful and yet very simple. We were teaching the YWCA of Watsonville, California, which has very high rates of uh, not just teen unplanned pregnancy, but re get girls getting pregnant a second time. And they said, we really need something around feminine norms. Machista codes of femininity in this community are very strong. And they tell girls that they need to be you know, beautiful, yet deferential, and they need to have families and, and be passive and silent and blah, blah, blah. And so you know, we came in and taught them to do some of these exercises. And you know, they said, you know, we can't, if we can't get the girls to stop talking some days. The exercises are over. And I said, you know, what's, what's going on? And they said, you know, there's, there's no place for them to talk about this. You know, middle school is like a pressure cooker. It's like a pressure. You have the same kids all day in the same environment. You can't get out. You know, you can't decide to even change desks or change classes if someone's bothering you. You can't complain to the prison guards, <laughs> right? Because that makes you a think, and you still got to go right back into the prison population. And now they're really mad at you. So it's like a pressure cooker, but you have to master these norms. And if you don't, there's all these names that they call you. So it's like a pressure cooker, and these girls have no place to talk about it. And I made this joke this morning, um, you know, because I actually, <laughs> actually played high school football, another story. And I said, there's no occasion where you can walk into the football locker room. Guys, you can't walk into the football locker room after hard practice and go, it was just so tough out there. I feel like I'm going to cry. <laughs> that coach was so mean to me today. I'm just not coming back tomorrow. You can't have that discussion with guys. You've got to man up. Well, it's the same with the girls. You know, they're competing for the same guys. They're in the same classes. They're doing, you know, trying to wear better, they they're, they're want to wear better outfits, have better hair, the whole thing, be thinner. I mean, these girls are competition, and they're with them every day, and they talk about each other. It gets posted on Facebook, and God only knows what else. There's no place until an adult comes in and says, what stays in this room, what's said in this room stays in this room. There's a safe space. Today, we're going to talk about the pressure to be girls. And that's what we're also finding. And I'm, I'm picking on girls because a lot of our work is girls. We should be talking about boys, too, so forgive me for that. It's the same thing we're finding in Pittsburgh. Many of these girls who are in economically stressed neighborhoods, they do not have the parental involvement they need or want. They are getting zero training on this, and they are struggling with what it means to be young and black and female and what girlhood means and what they should be doing around femininity, and they're struggling. And maybe their boyfriend isn't kind to them, or they feel like they have to sex it up. There's a whole bunch of things that happen, and it's not just about, I mean, we do most of our work in cities. It's not just about urban communities and inner city environments. This is also happening with you know, white boys in rural Lubbock 
Okay, this is all across the country. We are not having dialogues with our kids about gender norms. The ones who are teaching our gender norms again are music videos and games and social media and movies, but it's not us. It's not our school systems, it's not our policymakers, it's not our foundations, and that's what needs to change. The evidence pretty unambiguously, at least in the international sphere, says when you talk to kids about gender norms, you get better outcomes in things like reproductive health, education, partner violence, economic empowerment for girls, you get better outcomes than if you ignore it. I don't think anybody in that room finds that's, that's controversial, but we're not doing it. So I go back to Hortensia Morrow and Love, Sex, Power. The paper has been cited a thousand times. It has zero impact. When you look at the major documents in this country, the major programs, when we went to the CDC to find the gold standard programs, to find one gold standard program that addressed teen pregnancy and sexual health, they had a really strong, specific focus on teaching boys and girls to think critically about rigid gender norms. How many of the 26 programs that had been certified by the CDC as evidence-based, how many of them were gender transformative? Zero. Zero. That, my friends, is what a research policy disconnect looks like. That is what a disconnect between research and policy looks like. So I know you guys get this. I won't belabor the obvious. I will say that we are hoping to move forward with a project here in Columbus with the guidance of foundation and the fund. Um, we think we have the right pieces in place. What's been missing in the US right now is just you know one place where we can say there was a pilot and it was done in XYZ city and boy, it really worked. And that replicable pilot can go across the country. Um, I have been in discussions with the Chicago Department of Public Health to do something similar. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we did it here first and Columbus ate their lunch? <laughs> so thank you all for having me for lunch, and I look forward to this discussion in the Q&A, and thank you again for having me. So, Ricky, this is called the interlude. I, you're getting comfortable. I'm supposed to do lively banter. So. I'm getting catatonic. Is what I'm catatonic. Um, uh, we had the pleasure of meeting last night at a dinner, and we had a lovely dinner with a lot of people. And throughout this dinner, I kept saying to myself, I'm the wrong person to be up here. I was saying the same thing. I thought so. <laughs> But well, we couldn't get anybody else. So I decided I was going to channel all those people from dinner last night. So to be fair to them, I want to identify those people. And then any mistakes are my own, but if I get it right, it was inspired. It was just a lovely dinner. Carol Andrea, who was a founder of the Women's Fund, hosted us. Christy Angel from the Mayor's Office. Dan Good for Columbus City Schools. Lisa Cordes from the Columbus Foundation. Rashika Roberts from the Health Department. Donna James from the Center for Healthy Families. Sharon Davies from the Kerwin Institute. And Nicole Dunn from the Women's Fund. They just you guys just had a lovely conversation. I took a, a lot of notes, so I'm going to steal blatantly from them. The first question is, let's ground it a bit, um, because it's one thing to talk about at the 10,000-foot level. You talked about the curriculum and some simple exercises. Give people an example at the ground level. What kind of exercises do you do so that people can get a grasp of it? Sure. Uh, one of the simplest ones that I do is, is called, um, actually, originally of the international people. It's called the man box with young men. You put up you know, a piece of paper and you write, or a blackboard, and you write on it man, boy, and you write on you know, girl, woman. And then you ask kids to fill in you know, what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman or a girl. And they can produce all those adjectives really quickly. And then you can have this really good discussion about, well, do you feel that you fit? And what happens when you don't fit? And, do you feel pressures to do this? And does this impact your behavior in any way? Or are you uncertain? And why is it so different? And can girls do things from the boy list? Can boys do things from the girl list? And there's a whole bunch of discussions you can have from that. One of the things that I like to leverage off of sometimes to help them um, start to think consciously about the pressures they're under is I do a second exercise called, what are you called? And then you know, we write you know, boy, boy, man, you know, woman, girl. And I say, all right, what are you called if you don't fit that first list? And they can generate that list of adjectives, which are mostly very unpleasant, um, really quickly, too. In fact, my eight-year-old daughter can probably generate that list, unfortunately. And then we have that discussion. Why, 
why have we developed this enormously elaborate vocabulary in the English language for stigmatizing the least degree of, of gender nonconformity, especially for boys? You know, why is that so important to police that? And why is there so much energy? And why do kids do this? And then we have that discussion about the pressures they feel under and the, the fear sometimes. And um, this can be very, very, as I said, very, very powerful um, discussions if you have them. It, it, it takes someone actually coming in and doing that exercise and creating a, a safe space. And I'm going to put you on the spot here uh, and ask you if you might want to talk about your little safe space exercise around STEM because I found that a very compelling story if you feel like sharing it. That was, oh, thanks. Uh, that was a good story. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to appropriate that and use it as my own in the next, next meeting. So you better get credit here. <laughs> That one's mine. All right, okay, it's all yours. I'll just be very brief. In a former life, I had the chance to work on developing Metro STEM School with a lot of people. And uh, one of the issues we faced in the first year is we had an overwhelming percentage of boys apply for the school. Uh, I think we had 500 applicants the first year for 100 spots, and like 80% of the applicants were boys, 20% were girls. And we thought, this isn't acceptable. So we went back to those boys and girls, and we said, what would work to get you more attractive? And what we found was there were two arguments. One, do you want to come to a STEM school where we're going to emphasize engineering, math, and blow up things? Um, and secondly, uh, do you want to come to a place that is a safe, nurturing, small learning environment? And we found that when we would go to, when we go around to recruit middle school uh, students, the girls overwhelmingly, if we led with the safe, nurturing environment and then said STEM will go on, that was far more attractive to them. And then with the boys, you lead with STEM, and oh yeah, it's a safe environment as well. And so just that little shift in the narrative that allowed the girls to have a space, like you said earlier, where I can be math and be in middle school, but I know it's safe, uh, made a major difference, I think, in our moving the numbers. So yeah, thanks for good asking. Work. Good work. So who's, what role? I, no, I'm all confused. I've always been confused about my roles. All right. <laughs> <laughs> You may feel free to share your gender confusion. This is family. Thank you. You're in, a safe, you're in a safe space here. OK. In front of my 230 closest friends. That's, that's good. Um, the, the mailbox, the, the female box. Uh, McDonald's, as you know, recently, uh, after years of uh, when you pull up into the fast food line and say, do you want the boy toy or the girl toy for the Happy Meal, they have finally said not to do that and to say, do you want the Transformer or do you want the My Little Pony? Good sign, bad sign, what does that mean? The end of life as we know it. <laughs> you know, it's a trivial sign of something that they should have known a long time ago. But, uh, you know, we start pushing kids into these boxes from birth. I was just telling the story. Someone did a study years ago. It's very well known. They gave um, parents a crying baby. And they said, uh, it, it's a boy. And they start, the parents immediately start bouncing the boy. And they look up and they say, he's, oh, he's angry. They do the same thing with a different set of parents and say, it's a girl. And they say, oh, she's sad. And they start caressing her and soothing her. You know, it really just, it really starts from birth. And I'm glad that McDonald's is uh, getting a little bit of religion. I'd like to see them get a little more. <laughs> I'd like to see Disney do a little better. Did people catch Frozen? Have you heard that freaking song enough? Let it go, Ricky. Let it go. <laughs> I do the humor. I'm sorry. I, I do the humor. Gotcha. You mentioned. But I just want to say, Disney stood the gender stereotypes mostly on their head in that movie. You know, the girl saved the girl. I just want. I got to tell the story. So, when the, the, they got the the Broadway songwriters, I forget the team who wrote that, and they came back with this luminous, this wonderful song. And the original story was the usually, you know, guy kisses girl and wakes her up, crap that we've had for like 50 years. And they couldn't let go of the song. The song was so good, they actually rewrote the ending. Have people actually seen the movie or am I like, oh, okay. The, the reason that, that romance that starts out so good and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he turns out to be a bad guy with no setup, up until that point, it was supposed to all work out. And they had to rewrite the whole movie to keep that song and then make it the girl. And so he turns into a bad guy, and the girl rescues her sister. Well, who knew? Girl empowerment was worth a billion dollars and climbing. It's now going to be a show on ice, and they're working on, on Frozen 2. Who knew? But you know, it's all about you know, 
there's a market for doing this. You know, boys don't always, most of the boys don't always want to push to be strong and macho and silent. Girls don't always want to be the one who gets kissed by the prince. Who knew? Katniss Ooh. Everdeen is teaching us all something. <laughs> right. Uh. <laughs> and boys are going to see those movies. Boys, are, boys went to see Frozen in equal numbers, and boys are going to see those movies. You talked about intersection earlier, particularly between race and gender. Another big part of intersection, as you know, is culture. And so we can get to race and gender, but you know, when you start talking about religious culture or ethnic culture and gender, you know, whether it's Middle Eastern, Native American, Jewish, Catholic, whatever, that brings a whole other spin to this conversation. What can you share about how you bring all those cultural norms into this conversation? Well, there are two pieces to that. I want to start with intersectional approach, which I just, just reminded me that in, my, in my, my presentation, I probably didn't talk enough about it. But the whole idea is that I think we've gotten better in America talking about, at least in, in funding, in philanthropic and in policy circles, about accepting the importance of discussing race and class. What we haven't done is we've kind of left off the gender thing, or if we do the gender thing at all, it's kind of, you know, it's the girl thing. Okay, we've got to talk about gender and girls, we get it. And so the whole idea around the gender norms approach is actually to do this intersectional approach that sees gender, race, and class as inseparable. And um, I, I think that's where we're getting, and I probably didn't talk about that enough, but this, this idea comes from a legal scholar named Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a friend and just brilliant. And, um, and it's finally starting to catch on that these, the siloed approach in policy and funding that says, oh, you know, here's a racial justice portfolio over here, and you know, here's a policy around LGBT and sexual orientation over here, doesn't really work, because people don't live their lives in silos. People live integrated lives where they have several different identities that meet and intersect. Most of us do not have the luxury of simple, uncomplicated identities, and therefore the programs and policies that address us and our lives need to be a little messy and complex too. So that's the intersectional piece. When you get into the cultural piece, that's another overlay. Even within one community, there will be lots of different you know, cultural impacts. And the, the um, work that we did with the YWCA in Watsonville is a really good example because that dealt with young Latinas. And one of the things we found, and this has been documented, I mentioned machista codes of femininity and their impact on, on reproductive health behavior. The, the, there's nuance to this. The challenge wasn't, it wasn't that simple. It wasn't just, well, you know, here's the Hispanic community and they have these codes. It wasn't the girls who had just emigrated in and probably, you know, I'm using stereotypes myself, but, you know, went to, went to church every morning and so forth and, you know, we're, we're doing, you know, we're doing that thing. And it wasn't the girls who had totally acculturated and, you know, were downloading Lady Gaga on their iPhones. It was the ones in that middle of that acculturation curve. They weren't quite going to mass every morning, but they hadn't quite figured out being fully acculturated. And it was in that middle zone where they didn't have kind of a guiding light, if you will, and they weren't quite, didn't quite have their sea legs. It was in the middle that girls were most likely to engage in unsafe behavior or have an unplanned pregnancy. And so the impact of culture is, is enormous. I mean, the whole, gender norms are cultural. I mean, we may, we, sex may be a biological given. You can have an interesting philosophical, philosophical discussion about that. But assuming that even the sex is a given, everything that happens after basic physical sex, the clothes we're wearing, the way we're sitting, our gestural language, our, our posture, our hairstyles, all of that is, is taught to us by culture. And if it's been taught to us by culture, it can be changed. And that's kind of the idea behind gender transformative approaches. And as World Bank just put out a paper and one of her first statements was, the good news is social norms can be changed. I thought, thank God, I can keep doing this work. <laughs> Life is not over. One more question, and then please line up for questions. I have a feeling there's, there's going to be a lot of questions. So one more question, but line up as I ask this question. Um, we talked last night, and you talked a little bit this morning at the table with me, that one of, you're in it for the long game, and a lot of people uh, who are in this cause are in it for the long game. And one of the strategies is gender norming just for its own sake is a basic civil right human dignity issue is fine, but tying it to a health issue or tying it to what we were talking last night about burning platform issues, whether that be human trafficking or domestic abuse with the recent Ray Rice stuff um, or, or a variety of those things. Talk a little bit about the strategy of connecting this cause, for lack of a better word, to these economic development health issues. Why is that such a good strategy? 
Why is it a good strategy to talk about gender norms and these issues? Yeah. Because you get better results if you talk about them than you know. I thought I made that clear. <laughs> but, <laughs> next question. <laughs> Apparently, my entire presentation was a loss. <laughs> I should, do we have time, Andrew, to start again? Can I do that? But um, no, I mean, I, I think that it's, it's got to be an implicit part of the dialogue, and it, it, it often does get dropped off the table. And what interests me, I think, in your question is kind of like, why are we not doing it here? When I go to meetings of the international people, it is just accepted that you talk about gender norms as part of changing harmful cultural behaviors. And they don't, there's not even any question about it. And yet, when you come to the US, there's just, you can hear the crickets chirp. And I just find that both fascinating and appalling. Like, what is that about? And it would be better if people said, oh, I, this gender norms thing is crap. I don't get what you're trying to do. But people nod their heads and say, yeah, you're right. This is totally right. But we still haven't done it. And I think part of the answer for that is that you know, the people who have done really the yeoman work on this have been academics. And you and I had this discussion. It's publish or perish. They're not interested in doing the messy, hands-on, apply, go into the community. And, you know, and plus, they're not paid to do that. That's not their day job. And so what happens is these discourses circulate endlessly at academic conferences and in papers, but it never leaks out to impact policy and programs and funding. And so the idea is that the next time around, it isn't in the academic court in discourses around economic empowerment and reproduction, they've done that, is to get these other discourses and funding and policy to start doing that. And that's kind of the missing piece. And I think if we can do that, we will get a lot more bang for our buck and also um, help make a lot of kids' lives much, much healthier and better. Please line up if you have questions. You can see there's just a line out the door there. <laughs> Okay, we're going to give away free beer to anybody who has a question. <laughs> See, that did it. The free beer always works. You played it much too soon. We said we wouldn't play that card. That's right. So I should have waited. Hi. Hi, Andy Campbell. Thanks so much for being here. I'll get, I'm happy to get a ball rolling. I can understand how we can influence children because they're, you know, the tabula rasa, blank slate, and easy, hopefully, to bring along and teach. But what do we do about the rest of the society? What can we do to change preconceived notions of what these gender uh, norms are? Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to push back on the idea that the kids are tabula rasa. I, I thought that until I had my daughter. It is amazing just how much is embedded and how little control you have. I mean, you think you can teach them anything, but you can't. They come out with very strong prerogatives. So um, it was a learning experience for me. You can affect some of them, but boy, it's amazing how much the genetic code determines stuff. But I think it's a good question. I'm not sure I have the answer. I think in very narrow terms, how can I do this program or change this dialogue or this particular issue? And I think in particular about the four issues that I named, where we have really solid research going back for decades. Um, but I think there is a larger question that you touched on, how do we change society more generally? Um, and one of the limitations of the work that I end up doing is if you do get a project, you go in and you do this school or these grantees, you end up talking directly to the kids which is great, that's your first point of contact, but you're not doing anything to change their families of origins or their classrooms, unless it's school-based, or their religious institutions, often which are very, are repositories of very traditional and rigid ideas around gender. And that's kind of a larger discussion that needs to happen. Why this is such a problem in the US has always intrigued me. You know, I've traveled in, in Europe, not as much as I should, and I, I've talked to people from you know, other countries this is the only country they've ever found where you have to put real in front of man or woman for it to mean anything. I mean, as far as I'm aware, you know, the French people don't say, oh, so-and-so's a real man. <laughs> you know, they don't do that. <laughs> that was the worst French accent ever, wasn't it? And, <laughs> and you know, the Brits don't say, oh, you know, you know Margaret Thatcher, that's a real woman. We seem to have this real feeling of insecurity that we're not living up. And we have to, like, really, you know, man it up and woman it up each day. And I'm not sure exactly why that is, but it does seem to come out. We seem to be a culture that is uniquely transfixed as a nation about meeting these gender ideals and that we might be failing and we all have to try really hard. And I don't know why that is. The Europeans are much more relaxed about this stuff, much more relaxed, in my experience anyway. Please state your name and no editorials by anybody. <laughs> I'm Julie Graber and I had an organization called Gender EQA i kind of trying to decide which question to ask. Um, there is, um, 
it's interesting to observe um, feminism the way that it's being defined by some of our young, uh, uh, hip, uh, popular uh, cultural figures like, say, Beyonce. Oh, I thought you were going to say I was going to say Ricky, yes. Um, and I, it's interesting to me every time I have a conversation about whether or not she's, whether or is she or isn't she a feminist, uh. how do you start to kind of sort out or talk about um, the images that those create about feminism and um, what young women really need to be thinking about in terms of gender norms and priorities? Well, with my daughter, I have these conversations all the time. I mean, why do you have a male star up there and a female star? And you say, why do you think the female star is mostly undressed? Why is she mostly undressed? Can't she just make it on her voice? And you know, is it bad to be undressed in front of a lot of people? Is that okay? Is it, is it good or bad? How do you feel about that? And you know, just why don't boys have to do that? You know, why don't you see a boy up there and nothing but you know, a jock strap and high heels? You know, doing this is like <laughs> bad image. Okay, over lunch. Sorry, <laughs> but um, um, and we have these discussions constantly. I said I don't think I can change her mind about anything. I can't, but I can certainly teach her to think critically and consciously about what she's seeing and taking in. Because especially at younger ages, they just take it in. They're not thinking about it. Those images, I mean, just, just feed in. She's in front of the TV or the Kindle or something, you know. And, um, we monitor some of it, but some of it, you know, I want her to think about that stuff. So that, I think, is a constant struggle. And um, it's a battle for every parent. Hopefully, eventually, if gender transform approaches take over, the schools will be doing this too. And after school programs and even programs that are based in religious institutions, that would be a great dream. As far as you know, the, the larger social dialogue, I'm not sure I have you know, an answer on that about feminism. You know, what counts as feminism is certainly contested turf right now. Um, we've been working with the Women's Funding Network to um, basically kind of relaunch how feminist philanthropy anyway is looked at by asking them to asking donors to start looking at doing a gender norms approach instead of just doing gender equity and saying, well, you know, we did the gender equity piece, our gender lens is complete. And saying, you know, at least in feminist giving, we need to start addressing gender norms as well as gender equity. Because if you can get funders doing it, then you get nonprofits doing it. And then hopefully you get the community doing it and you can make change. So I would at least like to see that. As far as the larger issues, I'm not sure I have any any magic bullet today that, you know, yeah. it's... Yeah. Just, just a quick follow-up. Yeah. You, you talked to me last night about what's the umbrella. And when you take feminism or LGBTI or whatever, you were making the point last night that the umbrella really is gender norming and these things fall into it. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that logic? <sighs> yeah, I mean, Two it, goes back, no, it goes back to the question about feminism. I mean, the feminist project has always been split kind of down the middle, at least American feminism as I know it. One part is about, you know, you know, are we about increasing equity and opportunity for women and girls? Obviously we are. But do we also need to change society and how masculinity and feminine is approached to do that? I, I hate to use the Brown versus Board of Education language because it is loaded, I understand that. But in a sense, the dis discussion we're having is separate but equal. You know, can you have very different and separate forms of masculinity and femininity and still have equality, or do you need to open those doors up and allow boys to be a wider range and girls a wider range, and is that a better path? Or can you just simply keep gender roles as they are and still, get, and we're still having, I don't think anyone's answered that question, um, but I think that's still a discussion philosophically that the movement is having. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways it's being impacted now is that the so-called queer theorists have arrived on the scene and basically said, well, it's not just about equity, it is about overturning a gender system that oppresses LGBT people as well as non-LGBT people. And there's this whole space in the middle, which for lack of a better term, people are just calling you know, gender queer. Um, and that's an area that needs to be explored, not just to make freedom for those people, but to open up the whole dialogue. And so feminism, you know, I hate talking about feminism because it's just it's such a big topic, but there is kind of this whole movement to open the model up and say, you know what, the old model of strict binary genders that have equality has not worked, and we need to find ways to open that up. And that's kind of a discussion that's still being had. Next question. Probably more of an answer than you wanted. No, that's great. <laughs> 
Uh, my name is Carl Friedman. Uh, you, I, you may have already answered my question, but I didn't. I couldn't just sit down without asking since I already stood up here. So, um, <laughs> what is it about other countries that you think is different about this country, and why that? discussion is able to be had, as you say, it's just a part of the discussion. Is there something that you, I mean, I think you already said you don't know it, but that was my question. Mm -hmm. Have you, you there's got to be something in the yeah. psyche or that in their culture right. that allows them to be more open to that than what we're struggling with here. Well, I think, I think other cultures in general are not as nervous and worried about uh, masculinity and femininity as we are. They may be very more rigid, but I'm not sure they're so this whole real man, real woman thing. But in terms of why they are better at addressing it and why this is caught on internationally but not here, my own theory, which is probably shared by no one, but my own theory is that if you're going to work in, like my partner does work in, in Cambodia and, um, and with Cambodian girls, if you're going into a developing country, an underdeveloped country where, um, actually Cambodia is not a great example here, but if you're going in an underdeveloped country, just for example, where um, women cannot own property, um, women cannot select their mate, uh, and women can't even expect to be uh, his only spouse, or walk down the street unescorted by a male, and there are plenty of, plenty of countries that, that, that meet that criteria, you kind of have no choice if you want to increase equity for women and girls, but to address those cultural norms. And so I think that the international folks have kind of been forced, uh, certainly in developing nations, to address cultural codes, even though the World Bank's coming to a little late. But they've kind of been forced to do that. I think in the US, women, although certainly I wouldn't say that women have full equality here, they don't, but women have enough rights and enough uh, social um, um, resources that the feeling is, you know, we don't really have to work on that equity anymore. It's just about providing resources and opportunity and money and information. And there are a lot of people in academia who are saying, no, 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 we still have to talk about cultural norms. It's just these are with more empowered women, but it still is a huge driver of behavior, especially in adolescent and teenage years. We have time for two more questions. Okay, um, my name is Julia Applegate. I work at the Columbus Public Health Department on an LGBTQ health initiative. I don't have a question um, for the whole group, but I do have an offer to make to those folks here. Um, we offer cultural competency trainings for how to provide care to um, people that are serving the gay and lesbian queer communities. And critical to those trainings is a discussion of gender roles, um, gender norms, how to work with the population. And we'll be here after the luncheon ends. And if anyone's interested in those trainings, please find myself or the health advocate that's sitting at the back table there. His name is Dwayne. We have some of our materials. Um, we offer those as a public service for free. You can get continuing education credits for those, and um, I really appreciate the work you're doing. I've been following it first as an academic 20 years ago, and um, now actually in the policy angle. So we are working hard in Columbus to try to bridge that gap. So thanks, thanks, Julia. Thank, thank you. Next question. Hi, thank you, Laura McDonald with Benefactor Group. Um, what you've shared is very compelling, but I know from our work with organizations like the Global Fund for Women that there are still huge disparities in the philanthropic support that's directed towards women and girls versus boys and men. So how can we raise up gender norms without somehow using that to cloud this issue of disparity or to allow those who um, perhaps have not uh, reached equity in their funding to continue to have inequitable funding but use gender norms as an excuse for not providing greater resources for women and girls? Well, I think I'm going to fall back on the World Bank as the example. The idea that there's a division between equity and norms is illusory. You can get some bang for the buck just doing equity, but at some point you will sealing out. You'll start to run against those cultural gender codes. So at some point you have to kind of deal with, with gender norms. Um, and you know, I, I'm not sure that that's really a challenge. We should be having these discussions anyway. They're not expensive or time consuming, it's not a huge philanthropic commitment. Implementing these programs is really at a minimal cost. So um, I like to think that they reinforce each other with uh, the paper we did for Women's Funding Network, which is actually on our website if anybody wants it, and, and the fund here also has many copies. Um, we're making the argument essentially that women's funding needs more money but has not been successful at getting mainstream non-gender funders to 
fork over and provide more, and that one of the avenues for doing so, if you can engage them on the gender norms piece, you open up a whole different conversation that does include men and boys, as well as women and girls, and that may actually, instead of cannibalizing the existing funding, may actually bring in more funding from institutions that are not just focused on women and girls. And that allows us to reinvigorate the feminist dialogue and actually have a dialogue with mainstream funders who might not have opened the door if we said, oh, we just want more money for women and girls, like we heard that last year. This is a way to have a different discussion with them around gender norms that not only includes women and girls, but men and boys, families, gay and transgender people. And also, if you do it right, it links to their concerns around race and class, because that's always part of gender. Two things, Ricky. One, uh, welcome to the Columbus community, and I have a feeling you're not going to be a stranger. Secondly, uh, your essence reminds me of a, a line from a poem by the 13th century Sufi poet Rumi. Out beyond right, wrong, right doing and wrong doing, your truth and my truth, there is a field. I will meet you there. And I think your work tries to create those fields where we can go over to a different way. So thank you very much for coming. Thank across. you. What a valuable forum. Uh, we encourage you to continue the conversation in lobby over coffee and cookies. And the cookies are really, really good. Um, remember that you can view and share all of our forums at, on Columbus TV Channel 3, statewide on WOSU through its relationship with The Ohio Channel, and anytime on CMC's website via YouTube. Once more, thanks to our partners, the Women's Fund of Central Ohio and the Columbus Foundation and our sponsor, Outlook Media, and obviously to our speakers, Ricky Wilchins and Brad Mitchell. We hope to see you soon in another CMC forum. <laughs>